This is Talkback, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. This is News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. KGVO, Missoula's news and weather station. Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's a brand new week this Monday, June the 3rd, 2024. A talk back is brought to you this morning by Phillips Janitorial. Residential and commercial cleaning is what they do best. No one does it better. No job is too big or small. Call 406 260 6617. Also brought to you by Y West Storage out of the Y on Two Smokes Way. If you need a price and availability of a storage unit, here's the number 406 510 0590. Y West, they are making room for you. And by Harrington Surgical Supply, you can feel confident in their discreet and knowledgeable guidance on a multitude of products and medical supplies. The views and opinions expressed on TalkBack are not those of the staff, management, or advertisers. I want to say welcome once again to our good friend, Mr. Nick Christensen. Good morning, Mr. Nick. Good morning. All right. And uh, you golfed successfully. I did not golf successfully. (laughs) That's a long story. But we'll get into it later. But anyway, let's uh, let's get to the phones right now and say good morning to our featured guest for this hour, uh, James Brown, uh, Public Service Commission uh, Chairman. Uh, a president, rather, and he's now running for state auditor and insurance commissioner. So, Jim, good morning, sir. Good to have you on Talk Back. Hey, good morning to you. It's always a pleasure to be on. And, of course, I have to give a shout out to my alma mater, the University of Montana Grizzlies. Yo. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, we, we've got some some really good news about them. Uh, they're going to be on ESPN in November playing UC Davis. So it's going to be a nationwide audience. But so we're, we're thrilled about that. But that's not why we're here. <laughs> we're going to talk about yeah. you. Uh, let, let's talk about James Brown. Now, do you prefer James or Jim? What, what do you prefer, sir? Well, James Brown, uh, in honor of the great, late, great James Brown. Absolutely. Let, let's talk about James Brown and give us a little bit of your of your history. I know that uh, you've been uh, very much involved with the Public Service Commission uh, as uh, its president. And you I know you also ran for the Supreme Court recently. And so now uh, it's it's on to the state auditor, which uh, which will be vacant at the uh, at the end of this year. Yeah, you stated it correctly. Uh, your listeners probably have some familiarity with me because of my role as the uh, president of the Public Service Commission for the last three years and five months. And then, as you stated, I ran for Supreme Court in 2022, came up a little short there, though I won 41 of the 56 counties. I just couldn't prevail in some of the bigger cities. But uh, fourth-generation Montanan, great-grandfather homesteaded in Beaverhead County in the 1880s, uh, been in private legal practice for about 20 years, Represented mostly farmers and ranchers in Montana and small businesses. And then, um, uh, as stated, I'm running for state auditor this time. And the, and the reason for that, as you pointed out, is Troy Downing, the current auditor, has decided to go for Congress. And so this position was open. And just like when uh, I decided to run for the Supreme Court, people asked me to consider running for auditor when uh, Troy uh, made the jump to Congress. What are your qualifications for this position, sir? I, I'm pretty well qualified for this position. The The auditor's office, as Troy has explained on your show before, uh, the two primary duties are to regulate uh, insurance and securities uh, and then to serve as a member of the land board. I, I don't know how familiar your listeners are with the land board, but... Uh, uh, I bring a regulatory background uh, to this job by virtue of being on the PSC where you regulate other uh, entities, namely uh, energy providers. Uh, I have, a, as, I, as I stated, a legal license to practice law for about uh, 20 years and represented uh, businesses as part of that, which includes uh, valuation of insurance coverage and that sort of thing. And then I think I'm pretty unique in Montana history in running for auditor in that not only do I hold a legal license, I also hold an insurance producer's license. I'm I'm authorized to um, uh, sell insurance in the state of Montana. I don't do that uh, as a profession. I actually got that license in order to better understand uh, how insurance works and the products so that I could better advise my uh, legal clients. So pretty unique in that regard. And then, as you know, as part of my legal practice, I represented agriculture production uh, for a number of years, including the Montana Wool Growers Association, 
did a lot of work uh, with the land board as a private practice attorney, and so uh, I'll be able to assume that portion of the job pretty easily. And with that, we're up against our first break. By the way, the phone lines are open. The reason the reason uh, Jim is with us right now is specifically to take questions from you because the state auditor and insurance commissioner uh, is a very, very, it's, it's a vital part of uh, Montana's government. As you know, Troy Downing has been on once a month visiting uh, with us about the various uh, cases that he's been involved with and the advocacy that he uh, tries to put forward for, uh, for consumers, especially when it comes to insurance, things like that. So if you have a question for Jim Brown, James Brown, give us a call, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5. Three zero nine. We'd love to hear from you. Several phone lines are open, and we'll be back with more right after this. Bitterroot Health. Dennis Bragg with the Town Square weather. Steady rain in the forecast today for western Montana as we get a stream of moisture coming off the Pacific. That will keep our day cool with highs around 60 degrees, looking at between a tenth and a quarter of an inch of rain easing off this evening. A wind advisory is in effect through this afternoon and tonight with gusts close to 30 miles per hour. A chance of rain again Tuesday morning with clouds all day, getting back to sunny conditions Wednesday and what looks to be a significant warm-up by this coming weekend with highs in the 90s. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is Talk Back for this Monday, June 3rd. I'm Peter Christian. The questions are over there. Uh, patiently waiting for your phone calls for James Brown, who's running for state insurance commissioner and uh, and state auditor. And one of the things that, uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you about, a couple things, actually. Um, I, I had uh, a dear friend who, uh, uh, very elderly, who was duped into uh, 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 by, by a scam artist and going out in the middle of the night, going to one of those, uh, um, one of the the, the uh, Bitcoin, you know, vending machines, and sending twenty thousand dollars because he had been convinced by this individual that if he didn't do that, he was going to go to jail immediately. The police were going to be on their way, that sort of thing. And uh, the, this individual was uh, severely uh, damaged medically, a couple of strokes and a heart attack. Uh, by this, and it was just downheartening to the whole family. And so I, I know that's one of the things you do uh, as as a state auditor is to look into things like that, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I, you had mentioned that Troy Downing had been a guest uh, on your show uh, on a regular basis. I, I know Troy has made uh, combating um, fraud, particularly online fraud, uh, one of the um, goals of his time as the state auditor, that would continue with me as well. Uh, what we're seeing it across the country is, is that fraud is becoming harder and harder to detect because of the increased use of um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and the, the methods of fraud, like you were just talking about with the Bitcoin here, are becoming more sophisticated and more difficult to catch and, and to prosecute uh, offenders. Um, part of the answer to this, of course, is uh, as Troy has talked about, is, is the education piece where the auditor's office can play a role in going out and educating the public uh, on these types of uh, fraud scams and, and what to be on the watch for. But the other piece, which I think the uh, auditor's office can be more aggressive on, is, is working with financial institutions uh, in order to to identify uh, suspected fraud and to uh, uh, seek recovery of uh or disgorgement of um, uh, funds uh, by fraudsters. You bet. Uh, I, I think that uh, that would bring some hope to people who have been severely financially damaged by by scams like these. Absolutely. All right. Now, I know one of the things you, uh, you emphasized uh, while we were offline was your participation in the land board. Now, why, why is that important? Uh, it's extremely important. The land board uh, has a really long history in the state of Montana. The land board was authorized under the original Montana Constitution, the 1889 uh, Constitution, and, and it's the land board consists of the five statewide officers, uh, including the auditor. And what the duty of the land board is is set forth in the Montana Constitution, the 72 Constitution, although it's a carryover from the 89 Constitution is to manage state trust lands on uh, for the benefit of public education in Montana. And uh, this is an important deal for schools in Montana. Uh, in 2023 alone, <clears throat> state trust lands, which are managed by the uh, land board, produced over $46 million for Montana's uh, K-12 public schools. 
the money was generated from other, other things, grazing leases, uh, on school trust lands, on timber sales, and forest products on 780,000 acres managed by the state of Montana, and uh, from minerals leasing, permitting, uh, sand and gravel agreements, that sort of thing, on 2.1 million acres of school trust lands. And so <clears throat> um, under the Montana Constitution, the state has an obligation to ensure that uh, children receive an appropriate uh, level of education in Montana, Montana, and the land board plays a key role in generating funds for this. And so, um, as I as I noted, I'm very familiar with the land board because my work for uh, agriculture. What I'm concerned about for the land board, and and we may get questions from this from callers, is is that uh, what I'm seeing over time is is that the land board is seeing itself more as you know a purchasing agent for the state of Montana to bring more lands within the uh, management of the state of Montana. Um, I don't support that concept because what that does when you approve, for example, conservation easements through FWP and that sort of thing is, is that you're taking, uh, you're taking private property off the tax rolls, which as we know from the recent uh, uh, property tax debate uh, results in uh, loss of income for counties at the same time. You bet. And with the, we're, we're up against another break, but we do have Skip waiting to visit with you. We're going to come right back. Several other phone lines are open if you'd like to talk with James Brown, who is uh, right, right now running for the Office of State Auditor and Insurance Commissioner. So give us a call. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-5309. As we all know, the, the primary election is tomorrow, so we will know just exactly who's going to be running. So we'll, we'll, we'll be right back after this timeout. Come- all right, crew, let's get her dug. Honey, you want to give me a hand? I'm planting that tree, remember? No matter how large or small your digging project may be, no matter how urban or rural, you must always call 811 before any digging project. 811 is our national one call number, alerting your local utility companies to come out and mark any lines they have near your dig site. You must call 811 at least two to three business days before any digging project so you can avoid hitting our essential buried utilities. This includes natural gas and petroleum pipelines, electric, communication cables, and water and sewer lines. So before you do this or this, make sure you do this. For digging projects big or small, make the call to 811. Brought to you by Common Ground Alliance. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. Who, me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. We are back. This is Talkback, 721-1290. That's our number, 1-800-568-5309. I'm Peter Christian. Nick Christensen over there taking your phone calls this morning. Uh, Joining us on the phone right now is Public Service Commission President James Brown. And Skip is uh, joining us on the phone right now. Skip, good morning. You're on with Jim Brown. Go ahead, please. And and thank you, Peter. And... And Jim, uh, it's good to hear you speaking. And I just tell Peter that uh, you, you just stole my thunder asking the question about the land board. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to I wanted to tell people that it's a wonderful background that Jim brings because of the extension of auditor is being one of the offices that is on the land board. And he just laid it all out and told everybody how important the land board is. And so... Um, I thought that I would also bring up then, since, since Troy's leaving and and uh, Matt had that office before him, and I think that Troy filled in some holes that Matt didn't, and I have a feeling he'll be filling in some holes that 
still need filling. And I thought I'd ask about this this question since since you talked about the land board already. And it has to do with people in uh, high density forest areas. And I'll, I'll just use the Bitterroot Valley as an example, where uh, where we are in need of forest fire mitigation in a lot of places, and and people are going to get hammered with with uh, increasing insurance rates, and and I'm not sure I know all the reasons for that. I know I have some property on the east side that is certainly vulnerable and more vulnerable every year. Is there is there anything that that we can do to make sure the insurance companies are treating people fairly instead of taking advantage of this situation. People don't understand it. And I know I don't. Could you delve into that a little bit? And, and sir, I hope that Tuesday morning you're, you're relieved, uh, and, and know what you're going to go do. And, uh, you can take a break for about 20 minutes and then please <laughs> go back to work. <laughs> Thanks Thank for the call, Skip. Much. And I'll listen. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, and, and Skip is uh, one of my favorite people in Montana. I met him for the first time when I was running for Supreme Court in 2022. Um, founding Fathers, I'll just say a little bit about Skip and why uh, it's important to have an informed electorate. So the Founding Fathers uh, clearly stated that the way that the American um, governmental experiment would work, and the only way it would work is, is if we have an informed uh, electorate and Skip certainly meets that uh, definition. So a couple things there. One is is that if I if I don't prevail prevail in the primary tomorrow, um, I'll be just fine. I'll finish off my term at the Public Service Commission, and then uh, uh, one of the things I really enjoy in life is international travel, and uh, I always have wanted to see uh, Carthage and uh, Rome and uh, ancient uh, uh, history. So uh, if I don't prevail, I'm going to take a trip to. Italy, uh, Tunisia, and Algeria, and go see some of the Roman stuff. So I'll be fine. Well, that being said, the answer. Go ahead. No, I would, no nothing. I was saying, let, let, let's hope you don't have to pack your bags right away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, Skip has identified a real issue in Montana, and I tro know Troy has talked about this. Um, in a 2021 study by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, I identified that our, there are 4.5 million. U.S. homes in 38 states, including Montana, that are at higher extreme risk of wildfire. And as a result of that, as Skip was pointing out, uh, insurance premiums have been climbing uh, for the last uh, three or four years, particularly here in Montana, due to perceived wildfire risk. Uh, and as you stated, and as Troy has talked about, is, is that uh, some of the those who companies that provide uh, wildfire insurance in Montana are trying to pull out. Well, I agree with Troy. Uh, I'm not sure that that's lawful, and I would continue what Troy has done to say, no, you you provided this uh, coverage, and you're going to continue to do so. The answer uh, to Skip's question is is why uh, is this becoming a greater and greater problem? Uh, there are several factors. One is, of course, as Montana's population is growing, and what's happening is is that uh, what you're, what we've seen. Uh, is as people move to Montana because they want to live in a beautiful place and they're building in uh, areas that would um, otherwise be at risk for uh, wildfires, you know, in the wildland urban interface. And so that increases the risk. The second thing is, is that uh, we know as native Montanans that you have to take steps to mitigate against possible uh, fire risk. And, and I think a lot of folks that move into the state don't really understand that, you know, keeping trees a certain number of feet from your home and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but the third thing is, is that it's an, uh, part of it is an actuarial uh, problem. Uh, Montana is a, still a relatively small state in terms of population, even though we're growing. So what happens is, is that uh, Montana customers of insurance companies are sometimes thrown into the risk pool with higher risk states for wildfires, such as Colorado and California. And so what happens is, is that if you're part of that risk pool uh, for areas where uh, there's huge population centers, centers and there's huge damage when there is a wildfire, Montanans end up paying for that as part of their insurance premium. 
Now, is there is, is there any way to mitigate that? I mean, uh, uh, is there any way to appeal and say, you know, look, uh, Montana's a little bit different uh, than, say, Colorado or, or Wyoming or whatever uh, in the frequency and intensity of wildfires? Yeah, I think so. And the, and the first the first answer the first answer is is that we need to change Montana's insurance regulatory environment. I'm, I'm sure Troy has talked about this. We've got two things that. Um, make it unattractive for insurance companies to do business in Montana. This is one of the reasons I ran for the Montana Supreme Court. Um, the Montana Supreme Court and the court system of Montana is notoriously adverse to the insurance industry and very favorable to plaintiffs and plaintiffs' attorneys. And when you have large damage judgments, uh, I can assure you that the insurance companies themselves don't bear the cost of that. The way that that uh, payout is made, of course, is through an increase in premiums, which goes on to your bill. The second thing is, is that I don't think enough has been done by the last several auditors, and this is no criticism of Troy, who I like very much, but more can be done to, in the regulatory environment at the auditor's office to try to encourage new insurance companies to come in uh, to Montana so that we have competition uh, and consumers have choice, and, and in that way, you would both would um, encourage uh, companies to compete so that premiums go down, but also you would give consumers more choice in, in getting um, homeowners insurance and wildfire insurance and other things. Okay. Uh, um, phone- I think those are the two answers to that. Okay, phone lines are open. If you have a question or a comment for James Brown, who's running for uh, for the uh, state auditor and insurance commissioner a position currently held by Troy Downing. And uh, the phone lines are open. If you have a question or a comment, we'd love to hear from you. That's why he's here to answer your questions. Uh, not this, necessarily mine, but mostly yours. 721-1290 is our number. We'll be back right after this. We've all got that. Dennis Bragg with the Town Square weather. Steady rain in the forecast today for western Montana as we get a stream of moisture coming off the Pacific. That will keep our day cool with highs around 60 degrees, looking at between a tenth and a quarter of an inch of rain easing off this evening. A wind advisory is in effect through this afternoon and tonight with gusts close to 30 miles per hour. A chance of rain again Tuesday morning with clouds all day, getting back to sunny conditions Wednesday and what looks to be a significant warm-up by this coming weekend with highs in the 90s. And we are back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number. Phone calls coming in for James Brown, who is running for a state auditor and insurance commissioner. Let's get right on the phone and say good morning to Marilyn. Marilyn, good morning. You're on with uh, Jim Brown. Go ahead, please. Good morning. So, James Brown, we love you. We wish you could have got on the Montana Supreme Court. But if you can become auditor, that would be just great. So I guess my main point was if you were um, able to be auditor, could you have anything to do, say, about how now government agencies only, it seems like, are in the forest, supposedly doing the mitigating, managing of our forests? Um, The tree huggers, wacko environmentalists, they you know, private business. I mean, Anne Marie White, she has a forestry, White House forestry mitigation. Um, anyways, they can't, her business can't be in the forest. Small business is gone. Our timber industry shut down. Um, and yet now we just pile in a bunch of millions of dollars because we assume we're going to have all these fires to burn down our forest. So um, is there anything that you could do as auditor to make sure that we could get small business back in the forest, get our timber industry back up, and get these tree huggers out. All right, Marilyn, thanks for the call. Thank Jim, you. go ahead, please. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for the kind words. Second, um, I'm disappointed I didn't win the Supreme Court race either. I think if you've looked what's happened with the court in the last two years, you'll uh, find uh, absolute evidence that everything I talked about with the court being an activist court and legislating from the bench is absolutely true. That being said, is is that uh, proper state lands management is a is a issue that is very close uh, to home for me. As I talked about, um, my great grandfather homesteaded down in Beaverhead County in the 1880s. Uh, my cousins still have the homestead and, and still have an active uh, cow calf operation. Uh, down there, and you can imagine that they have uh, grazing leases on both BLM and Forest Service grounds. Um, 
certainly have watched what's happened in the 19, since the 1980s in terms of uh, proper forest uh, management, which has not been proper forest management. Um, we used to uh, be actively involved in forest management and managing the forest for multiple use, which multiple use means um, using the lands for um, um, uh, productive purposes, not just allowing it to sit uh, and degradate. Uh, as part of my legal practice, I was very involved in many, many federal cases uh, trying to protect the agriculture uh, industry and the um, uh, recreation industry and being able to use uh, the forest for uh, proper multiple use um, uh, reasons, which in, in accordance with the FLIPMA 1976 Federal Act, uh, some successful, some not. Uh, I will say this, the auditor's direct role in forest management is uh, little to zero, but this is where the land board does come into effect, is, is that as a member of the land board, uh, I will have the power, if you will, or authority to uh, ensure that at least a portion of state lands are properly managed for uh, productive use, and uh, productive use being uh, revenue generation for uh, state schools. Uh, and not for necessarily for conservation purposes, which I talked about at the top of my remarks, is that I really feel like the land board in recent years has uh, gone a, a policy direction where conservation is um, uh, overwhelming uh, productive use of the lands, and, and I'll try to um, reverse that and to ensure that uh, proper management of state lands uh, will result in less... Uh, Damage not only to the environment, but also less damage to the human infrastructure, for example, these wildfires. I remember years and years ago when I was interviewing uh, Mark Roscoe, who's running for attorney general and then for governor. And, and one of the things he was fond of saying was that he, he you know, hailed from Libby. And he said, used to, the, the name of the team up there is the Libby Loggers. And he said, you, can, you can't find a logger anywhere up there. Uh, and haven't been for, for many years now. So <clears throat> I, I think that's one of the things that have changed in the, in the business atmosphere of the state. Yeah, and uh, and it's interesting you bring that up because when I was in the high school in Dillon, Beaver County High School in the late 80s, uh, Libby was a Class A school. It was one of our competitors. Uh, but when my brother, uh, class of 1985, um, was in school, Libby was a double A school. And what you've seen through the loss of timber jobs up in Lincoln County is, is you've seen the corresponding drop of the high school from double A to Class B. I mean, what does that tell you? It tells you that uh, these management policies of federal lands and state lands are costing uh, costing people jobs and costing uh, uh, hurt and harming rural Montana. And that's that's a perspective I'll bring to the land board is that I grew up in rural Montana and understand it. Excellent. But with that, we're up against another break. Jeff is waiting very patiently to visit with you. James Brown is on the phone with us right now, and uh, he is running right now for the uh, the Montana State Auditor and Insurance Commissioner position, currently held by Troy Downing. And we'd love to have your phone calls. He'll be with us all the way till 9 o'clock, and then it'll be Rob Nadelson with us from 9 until 10. So give us a call, 721-1290. And we are back on Talkback. James Brown joining us right now. And uh, he, of course, running for a Montana State Auditor and Insurance Commissioner. Let's get Jeff on the line. Jeff, good morning. You're on with James Brown. Go ahead, please. Good morning, James Brown. In lack of a band of renown, I'm surprised <laughs> Peter Solos, Peter Christen didn't give you one of his famous drum solos. No, that you're thinking of Les Brown and his band of run out. James Brown would be Papa's got oh. a brand new bag. But anyway. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I got my Browns mixed up there. Go ahead. I'm an old guy, old confused guy. Um, yeah. Um, the, uh, I testified a couple of months ago in favor of the Laurel Power Plant. Um, there, uh, let me back up just a second. There's, there's something out there people like Robert Bryce and others have called the anti-industry industry. And we in Montana have really seen uh, the effects of that. You uh, you hit on it when you talk about Libby and the lack of logging up there. They shut down a couple of, of projects up there that would have really benefited the people in the area. Um, they want to shut down the Laurel Power Plant. They've, uh, they, they caused the, uh, their lack of action caused the uh, Lolo Peak Fire to burn out of control, destroying the old growth habitat that they valued so much rather than preserving it. Um, and now with the Laurel Power Plant, 
um, they want to rely on uh, on wind and solar. And, and recent uh, storms, tornadoes, and hailstorms in Texas have wiped out both uh, w- uh, wind farms and solar farms down there. Uh, but yet, the anti-industry industry here in Montana seems to be going really well. And so I have a couple of questions on that. Uh, first of all, uh, I see that the uh, that the uh, the Supreme Court has just heard arguments uh, for the Laurel or uh, against allowing the Laurel Power Plant to proceed, Northwestern to proceed. And uh, could you give an update on that? And then, as the auditor, say auditor, how do you expect that this uh, vile industry would uh, would affect your ability to uh, to uh, do what's best for the residents of Montana? Okay, thanks, Jeff. So, Jeff brings up some really important points that that need to be discussed more in the public sphere, and so I, I'm, I appreciate these questions. So, the first thing is is that uh, Jeff touched on something that uh, is really concerning me as a public service commissioner, and that is the fact that uh, in the United States, uh, thermal generation which would be um, coal and natural gas, is generation is coming offline faster than we're able to build new projects. And so what that means is is that forecasters, and we're talking third-party forecasters, this isn't a political issue, third-party forecasters in the energy industry are predicting that in the West, where population is exploding, and we're seeing the growth in Montana, that we have the strong possibility of brownouts or blackouts in the in the West and in the in the next ten year planning horizon. We're already seeing it in California. So what's happening is is that policymakers are making policy decisions that are shutting down uh, thermal generation uh, with no plan to replace that power. Okay. So in Montana, what's happened is is that in the 90s with the Montana Power Company, we were a net exporter of energy, particularly to the West Coast. But with the closure of the Lewis and Clark uh, coal plant in Sydney and uh, Coal Strip 1 and 2, what's happening is we're becoming a net importer of energy into Montana. And what that means is that our power companies are buying power on the open market, which is more costly, particularly in peak demand times. So Northwest Energy is trying to build a natural gas plant that essentially would serve as the base power to replace coal strip units one and two, okay? Montana Public Service Commission regulates the the costs associated with that, but what we don't regulate, which is the current issue that Jeff was talking about, we don't regulate the permitting of these power plants that's done through uh, DEQ. And DEQ is being sued by these environmental groups for basically permitting uh, this new power plant. And this is why the, the court system in Montana, I keep coming back to it, is so important because judges are shutting down, um, are trying to shut down the the building of this plant, even though the construction is moving forward and that's done through the permitting process. And that is why the held decision, which is also before the Montana Supreme Court, is so important uh, because uh, a single judge in Helena has basically said the Montana Constitution requires um, DEQ and other state agencies to evaluate, quote, global warming or climate change as part of the permitting process. And if that's going to be the law in Montana, then you're going to see even more challenges to the building of new generation. And that's a huge issue. Well, I, th- I think the, the one of the most important things about what you're talking about right here, uh, James, is delay, delay, delay. Right? Uh, as as long as they can, as long as they can, whoever the groups are, uh, whatever you name the the nonprofit or whatever, uh, uh, to, to just keep filing motion after motion after motion to keep these things uh, basically from ever being built, and who knows how long that could go on. That is correct. Uh, I mean, Northwest Energy has informed us, the Public Service Commission, that they believe that they can come online, uh, you know, setting aside the legal issues here. They can come online as soon as uh, this year, early next year for that Laurel 
plant. And the benefit to the state of Montana as a result of that, as I talked about, is just that you have you have power generation that's being produced in Montana for Montanans so that our power companies uh, aren't going out to the open market and having to compete for energy at high peak times like we saw in January 2024 when we saw, uh, you know, temperatures drop to 30 or 40 below, which, as you know, and people saw it on their power bills, uh, explodes the cost of your power bill because um, Northwest Energy is having to buy, a, you know, megawatt at $1,000 a uh, megawatt. I mean, think about that. Now, uh, uh, do you have any uh, any uh, uh, inside looks as, as what's going to happen with the Snake River dams being being shut down and and uh, and removed uh, because of the uh, what's going on with the Native American tribes in that area with the salmon and 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 that sort of thing? Uh, if that does happen, I know the Missoula Electric Co-op here in in uh, Missoula County will be devastated by that because that's where they get the bulk of their energy. Yeah, this is a huge issue for Montana, but uh, namely for those uh, customers and consumers that get their power through the co-ops. So the Montana Public Service Commission regulates private uh, utilities, Northwestern Energy and MDU, namely. We don't regulate the power co-ops. That's essentially done through the federal government. Now, the federal government used to be a great partner uh, to private industry in this country, particularly to rural America and Montana, by building projects that would benefit um, rural America. And that's what the Bonneville Power Administration was designed to do in those dams that you were talking about in, in Idaho, right, was they were designed to do multifunctions. One is to be reservoirs for agriculture, but also to provide uh, a cheap source of power for these co-ops. And incredibly... The Biden administration, this is just absolutely remarkable and makes no sense from a policy perspective. Biden administration, the first month it's in office in January of 2021, basically does the, you know, the 2050 green agenda, right? Well, the only way that you're going to meet the green agenda is two ways. One is that you've got to encourage um, <clears throat> more hydropower because it's a clean source of power. And two, you're going to have to build nuclear power because it, is, because it is the absolutely cleanest source of power. Then the Biden administration turns around and announces that it's going to breach <laughs> the dams, the hydro dams, uh, which are a clean source of power, which will put, uh, number one, their own agenda in jeopardy. But two, uh, as you stated, for those customers in, in uh, rural Montana and in, in Idaho that are served by co-ops, um, you're going to you're going to put their source of power in jeopardy. And then what's that going to do uh, to their bills when they have to go out on the open market to buy power instead of getting a firm source of power for BPA. It makes no sense from a policy reason, and it makes you wonder really how these decisions are being made and who benefits and, and to follow the money. You bet. With that, we're up against a little bit past the break, 721-1290. We still have all of our phone lines open. i got a call coming in right now for James Brown. Give us a call at 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. We'll be back after this. Dennis Bragg with the Town Square weather. Steady rain in the forecast today for western Montana as we get a stream of moisture coming off the Pacific. That will keep our day cool with highs around 60 degrees, looking at between a tenth and a quarter of an inch of rain easing off this evening. A wind advisory is in effect through this afternoon and tonight with gusts close to 30 miles per hour. A chance of rain again Tuesday morning with clouds all day, getting back to sunny conditions Wednesday and what looks to be a significant warm-up by this coming weekend with highs in the 90s. We are back on Talkbacks. 721-1290 is our number. I'm Peter Christian. Nick Questions and over there taking your phone calls. Producing talk back this morning, James Brown, uh, running for state auditor and insurance commissioner on the phone. And Elena is waiting. Elena, good morning. You're on with James Brown. Go ahead, please. Good morning. I have two questions. The first I want to say, uh, when I first came to Montana and got um, involved with politics and local government, I thought that the state auditor would do a forensic audit if requested of local government. And I don't think so. So if you can, 20 words or less, give a um, description, a definition of exactly what you would do, and who are you running against? And I'll listen off. Okay. Thanks for, thanks Thank for the you. call, Elena. Go ahead, James. Yeah, she brings up a great point. This adds to the confusion, I think, of the average of Montana and the average of Montana voters. So under the 1889 Constitution, 
the auditor's office actually did what uh, she was talking about, where the auditor would audit uh, other areas of state government. But that duty was taken away under the 72 Constitution and the auditor's office, which is really better called uh, the Commissioner of Insurance and Securities, uh, doesn't have that uh, audit government audit function anymore. Now it does audit insurance companies, for example, but uh, but not um, not other state agencies. Uh, I think the second part of that question was who my opponents were. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, nobody of consequence. <laughs> um, and nobody that they should vote for. <laughs> All right, well said. All right, so we, we have about two and a half minutes, and what we like to do with, with every candidate, oh, by the way, the phone is ringing. We got another call. We'll try to get one more call in before we let you give your stump speech because that's what we like to do is is uh, when a candidate's on, just to explain to folks why they should vote for you. So we'll try to get uh, one more call on if we can, and... Uh, We'll try to get to make room for that if we can with James Brown. So, but we have time. I'll go, go ahead. Nope, we don't have time. Let's we don't have time. Speech. All right. So, so it, it's time for your uh, for your stump speech. Uh, tell us why we should vote for you, sir. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Thank you for your time today. So, as I noted, my great grandfather came to Montana in 1882 from Flushing, New York, and the reason he did that was because he knew Montana was a place of opportunity to build a better life, to raise a family, and to prosper and to have freedoms. That ethos is still true in Montana in 2024, which is why we still have people coming uh, to the treasure state. I ran for uh, public office and to be a public service in 2020 because I want to make Montana a better place. Montana has been very good to my family for 140 years. And I want to represent you, the people of Montana, in a manner that allows you to enjoy the freedoms and the Montana way of life that we have enjoyed for the last 140 years. I can pledge to you uh, and your listeners that I will always come to work, I will work hard, I will work diligently, and I will always put the interests of Montanans out ahead of out-of-state corporations. Um, I'd appreciate your vote tomorrow. All right, so let, let's talk about uh, your website, how we can contact you if we want to donate to your, uh, should you win the primary, want to donate to your general election, well, how, how can we contact you? Yeah, my website is jamesbrown4montana.com. The four is spelled out. It's not numerical, so jamesbrown4montana.com. Uh, you can learn more about me and my history there, and you can also uh, donate online there as well. And then you can just do, a, frankly, a Google search of me, uh, James Brown in Montana, and you'll find a lot of articles about my uh, history in Montana and the work I've done on behalf of Montanans. Well, James, it's been a pleasure and an honor having you on. Appreciate it. Best of luck tomorrow, sir. All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you. You take care. All right. Uh, so that's going to do it for hour number one of Talk Back. Coming up in hour number two of Rob Nadelson from the Independence Institute. We haven't heard from him for a little while for uh, various reasons, but he's going to be with us uh, for in the nine o'clock hour, taking your phone calls at 721-1290. We will be back after the top of the hour with Rob Nadelson, uh, former law professor at the University of Montana. He'll be on from nine to ten. We'll be right back after this. This is Talkback, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. This is News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM, KGVO, Missoula's news and weather station. Hey, welcome back to Talkback. It's hour number two underway now. Talkback this morning is brought to you by Harrington Surgical Supply, where appointments are preferred for mastectomy fittings and custom compressions, but walk-ins are always Welcome. Also brought to you by Phillips Janitorial. For both home and business, no one does the job better and uh, your satisfaction is guaranteed. No job is too big or small. For Phillips Janitorial, 406-260-6617. And if you need a storage unit, just moved to town or uh, whatever it might be, you need some storage, Y West Storage is here to serve you at 7099 Two Smokes Way. For pricing and availability, here's their number, 406 510 0590 because at Y West, we're making room for you. 
The views and opinions expressed on TalkBack are not those of the staff, management, or advertisers. Okay, welcome back. Hour number two of TalkBack is underway. And I want to say again, thank you to Nick Christensen for producing TalkBack. He's right over there. He's already been busy uh, preparing for Rob Nadelson, who's on the phone with us right now. Good morning, Rob. Welcome back, sir. Good morning, and as always, it's a privilege to be on the best radio talk show on this side of the galaxy. Wow. <laughs> Can we retire now or what? Yeah. All right. There's a... There's a- there's a better one in the Delta Quadrant. Well, <laughs> well, it's it's more than a few light years away. I'm not worried about it. All right, let's That's right. <laughs> let, let's talk about. I know before we we where the phone lines are already filling up for people who want to visit with you, but you have a four part conversation that you have uh, issued uh, uh, from um, the Independence Institute about uh, Chief Justice John Marshall. So I want to give you a chance to weigh in on that before we start taking calls. Go ahead, sir. It's just four op-eds in a series written for the Epic Times, thumbnailing the life and times and law of, of our greatest chief justice. I agree with the majority opinion that says that he was our greatest chief justice. However, I disagree with the common portrayal of him as some kind of advocate of big government or as a model for what later became ju- judicial liberal activism. Um, in, in it, I talk about his early life. I talk about his contributions to the Constitution. He was a fairly important founder, which is not widely known. He helped to shepherd the Constitution through the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He served as a diplomat, uh, active in the notorious XYZ affair, notorious because the French uh, demanded money before, the, before they were taught the American diplomats, and the Americans came home. Um, He served briefly as Secretary of State. He also served briefly in Congress, gave a very famous speech there um, on international law. And then he served for 34 years as our fourth Chief Justice of the United States. And I discussed four of his opinions and show how what they actually said, show how they've been misrepresented, and then finish up with um, uh, finish up with uh, uh, the rest of his life. The series appears in the Epic Times. Three of the four installments have now been published also on the Independence Institute website, which is independenceinstitute.org. So it's kind of an interesting uh, civics lesson, I suppose you could say, as well as a history lesson. All right. Well, let's. Uh, we, we have another few minutes before we have to take our first break. So let's get Emmett's call in. He's been waiting. Emmett, good morning. You're on with Rob Nadelson. Go ahead, sir. Good to okay. talk to you again, Emmett. Thank you, and thanks for taking my call. I have a, a comment, a, a big comment, but also a question for you, so it's both. As you can probably imagine, I'm horrified, appalled, and disgusted at the, um, what, the way they have treated Trump, possibly even going to put him in jail. They convicted him on bogus charges. They've shredded the Constitution just to get their political enemies, just like they do in third world countries, and I fear for what's going to happen to this nation. I'm sure you have a lot uh, to talk about. I'm horrified, and I'm going to vote proudly for Trump tomorrow, but my question is this. Is this going to be a prelude to martial law? What I'm worried about is that if they put him in jail, there will be some sort of armed revolt, maybe at the Capitol or some other place. That'll give them the excuse they want um, for martial law. I feel like they're trying to get us wound up to do something violent for martial, so that they can just pull the trigger for martial law and take away all of our freedoms. It's like we're being set up for this. So is this a pretext for martial law for all of us? And what can we do going forward? All right. Uh, inter- interesting question. So, Rob, uh, go ahead. Thanks for the call, Emmett. Well, the foremost, foremost thing we can do is stay peaceful. Um, I agree that people on the left are, uh, who are in control are trying to provoke conservatives and others into doing something foolish. Our job is not to be provoked. I wrote an article in 2022, I think it was, about that notorious speech that Joe Biden gave with military guards flanking him on either side uh, on a black and white hellish kind of background in which he basically called half the country, meaning everybody who had supported Trump, um, a, a, a danger to the republic. I was convinced at that time, well, not convinced, I surmised at that time, that that was an effort to try to provoke violence and anger. Uh, we can't let them do that. I don't 
think that the response would necessarily be um, be martial law. It might just be something like the response to the to the J- January 6th Capitol riot. That's to say, heated rhetoric over you know uh, uh, not uh, unending propaganda, prosecution of of uh, some conservatives who were or weren't involved. So sit tight and um, do everything you can to make sure that the current regime does not remain in power uh, after this next election. All right. With that, with that, we are up against a break. So we have Catherine and Skip both waiting to visit with you. Several other phone lines open. If you have a question or a comment for Rob Nadelson from the Independence Institute in Denver, former professor of law at the University of Montana, uh, author. And, uh, and so we will continue with that conversation when we return right after this. Dennis Bragg with the Town Square weather. Steady rain in the forecast today for western Montana as we get a stream of moisture coming off the Pacific that will keep our day cool with highs around 60 degrees, looking at between a tenth and a quarter of an inch of rain easing off this evening. A wind advisory is in effect through this afternoon and tonight with gusts close to 30 miles per hour. A chance of rain again Tuesday morning with clouds all day, getting back to sunny conditions Wednesday and what looks to be a significant warm-up by this coming weekend with highs in the 90s. Hey, welcome back to Talk Back, 721-1290. That's our number, and we are honored and privileged to have with us once again uh, on the phone, Rob Nadelson from the Independence Institute. And uh, folks have been waiting on the line to visit with you. So let's, uh, by the way, the, we have several phone lines open if you want to talk to Rob, 721-1290. But Catherine is up next. Hi, Catherine. Good morning. How are you guys? Excellent. What's on your Good mind? Good morning, Catherine. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So just uh, something I've been mulling about, uh, the Secret Service is, is uh, under the Treasury Department, which is under the executive control of the branch of the government. So uh, can the president withdraw Secret Service protection from Trump now that he's been convicted? And the second part, second question I have is, what is the likelihood that the Supreme Court will intervene in this whole situation um, quickly before the election? Okay, I believe that these coverage of secret service of presidents and presidential candidates and former presidents is fixed by law. So if Joe Biden continues to respect the law, which we know he doesn't necessarily have a record of doing so, he could not withdraw secret service protection from uh, from Donald Trump. Um, and Catherine, what was the other question? Oh, um, what is the likelihood of uh, the Supreme Court intervening in this uh, situation before the election? Well, um, I think it's fairly low. Um, I mean, I think Mark Levin has said that the Supreme Court should bounce in now. I don't think the Supreme Court has that authority, even if it wanted to. And John Roberts is certainly not going to exercise it, given his belief in retaining the well, basically, judicial deference and retaining the integrity of the institution, as he would call it, meaning the integrity of the institution as interpreted within the Beltway. Um, the uh, uh, Alan Dershowitz has pointed out that the New York Court of Appeals could take. Oh, let me back up. In uh, in in New York State, in the New York State judicial um, uh, system, the most important trial court is for historical reasons called the Supreme Court and President Trump was convicted in the Supreme Court. Above him is an, is an appellate level called the appellate division of the Supreme Court and then the highest court of the state is the Court of Appeals. Now uh, Dershowitz point out, points out that Trump could petition the Court of Appeals to bypass the appellate division and consider the case and if the Court of Appeals issued an opinion and did so in a, in, a, in a prompt manner, then that could be reviewed by the Supreme Court in a prompt manner. But as you can see by the way I'm describing it, the, that it re- requires piling contingency upon contingency. You know, if the Court of Appeals agrees to bypass the appellate division, if the Court of Appeals responds quickly, if the Supreme Court responds quickly to the Court of Appeals decision, and, and, and so forth. So. All in all, I would say the probabilities of reviewing this thing uh, before the election and reversing the conviction, which I think eventually will happen, um, those po- those possibilities are not large. Okay. So, um, 
How, if they put him in jail, which I suspect that the judge is going to try to do, um, what kind of, what, if he is elected, which I doubt very much if he will be, I actually think that he's going to be, die in prison. Um, uh, what would, how, how would it work if uh, he was in jail and elected to the presidency? <laughs> wow. Um, well, I don't think that there's a judge in the country that would keep him in jail. I think the judge, judge would probably say, well, um, in view of the fact that you've got your executive duties to perform, we will suspend the sentence. That, that would be my, my guess. Um, yeah, I would be surprised if he goes to jail. I think that there's a, you know, I've, I've overestimated his enemies many times. His enemies are so, are so blinded by hatred that they never seem to act rationally. But the rational thing to do would be to avoid the martyrship of jail uh, and to simply suspend the sentence. Plus, there, there's, there, he's got no, I mean, it's a first offense. He's got no record. All right, Catherine. Uh, Anything okay, else, Catherine? Thanks. No, that's it. Thanks. All right, thanks for the call. We appreciate it. Skip is up next. Skip, good morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We lost Skip. Oh, so we did. Dave, okay, Dave's I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't no, see that. All right, let's get Dave on the line. Dave, good morning. You're on Talkback. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Peter. Thank you very much for taking my call. Um, Professor Nadelson, I would, I'm interested in... Um, particularly the Montana Supreme Court, you've written extensively on um, why it is in need of reform. Um, I wanted to ask you, well, two questions, really. What way do you think there is uh, realistically to reform the Montana Supreme Court um, in the short and the intermediate term? And then I have a, I have a follow-up if that's all right. Well, I think some reforms are more likely than others. The basic problem that Montanans face in reforming the Supreme Court is that um, it can be done one of two ways. It can be done by electing different justices, which is possible, uh, or, or it can be done more fundamentally by voter initiative, which is also possible, except that the court has essentially announced that it, it will veto any any initiative it thinks is unconstitutional, and any initiative it doesn't like it thinks is unconstitutional. So I, so reforming the court, I think the best approach is probably, besides trying to elect better people to the court, to uh, to pepper the court with constitutional initiatives. Uh, they would include uh, things like um, electing just justices by district. Uh, it might also include. Uh, partisan elections for justices, just you know, just keep coming at the court with, the, with these different initiatives. In Florida, they faced a similar situation where the court kept striking down limits on government uh, using its single subject rule, which is different from the rule that the Montana Supreme Court uses. And eventually, they just kind of overwhelmed the court and <laughs> uh, with, with an initiative that, made, that said that the single subject rule shall not apply to the initiatives we're trying to get passed. And uh, the court didn't have any pretext for striking down that one, so then the people went ahead and passed the initiative they really wanted to pass. So it, uh, unfortunately, it requires a lot of manpower and a lot of coordination to do uh, because, of the, because of the veto power that the court has adopted. So the quick answer to your question is it can be done, but it's going to be tough. Um, and then my follow-up is this. Um, <laughs> What do you think about the um, the prospect or the idea of um, using the legislature's power of the purse to limit the expenditures of the judicial branch of the Montana government by um, enacting a budget which severely or at least substantially curtails their spending power? You mean have the legislature uh, curtail the court's spending power? Yes, through, through you know, at every biennium, the legislature must pass a budget, um, and that includes a budget for the, for the Montana judiciary. That's a tough one because, I mean, the court has to be, constitutionally, the court has to be able to perform its duties. And uh, the problem that the court 
uh, represents is bad decisions. It doesn't really cost any more to make a bad decision than to make a good decision, right, as, as a rule. So I don't see how cutting the court's budget would help. It probably would just clog the court's calendar. And, that, and thereby reduce, potentially reduce the number of bad decisions they make. Well, yeah, but you'd also <laughs> have other decisions that should be resolved, uh, uh, criminal trial decisions that, that have to be that have to be dealt with. You know, there's one area I, I will I'll be honest with you about this. Uh, a lot of people don't like it, but um, one way to one 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 part of the puzzle of reforming the court is actually to increase one area of expenditure, and that is judicial salaries. Uh, judicial salaries in Montana are 47th among the states, even though Montana prices uh, tend to be somewhat higher than that. Uh, and in order for uh, somebody to run for the, for the court, that means uh, you know any qualified lawyer to run for the court probably has to take a significant, a very, very significant pay cut and then spend much of all of his time in Helena. Um, I think one of the reasons we don't have a very high quality court is that we don't get top talent to run for it. Um, I would, well, I'm gonna not say that, but um, but yeah, we don't get top talent to run for it, and one way to get better talent is, is to increase the salaries. That would, now, what people don't like about that, that, that sounds like yeah. rewarding them for a bad job, but the idea is to get better people to run for the court. As of right now, um, and I'm sorry if anybody doesn't like this, but we have a surfeit of mediocrity serving on the court. And with that, we're we are a couple of minutes past a break. We're going to come right back. Skip, Jeff, and Dave are all waiting to visit with you. We'll be right back. We're talking with Rob Nadelson from the Independence Institute. We'd love to have your phone calls. He'll be on with us till 10. So we still have some phone lines open at 721-1290. Town Square Media and... Chris Jackamick, I served in the United States Air Force, and I deployed three times. So in 2017, I was serving as an Air Force First Sergeant. Our motto in that role is, my job is people, everyone is my business. But unfortunately, in that year, I would lose my own brother. Lance Corporal Adam Jackamick to suicide. The majority of veteran suicides are from guns. I store my weapons securely, not only for myself, but for my family. Store all your guns securely. Help stop suicide. My service never stops. Brought to you by N Family Fire and the Ad Council. Okay, real quickly, I know, Rob, you wanted to expand a little bit on your answer before we get to our next caller. Go ahead, please. You know, Peter, while during the break, you said that the idea of raising the Supreme Court salaries was going to be a tough and I certainly agree with that. Let me just t tell you what it's inspired by, though. Uh, I have been reading Montana Supreme Court decisions since 1987. That's a long time. And not just on constitutional issues, but on all sorts of things. I wrote my first article on Montana Supreme Court decisions since 1990, in 1990. And one of the frustrations is, throughout, is the uh, persistent problem of of mediocrity on the court. I mean, damage done by people who in, who in many cases don't really want to do, do damage, who may not be power hungry, but just don't see legal issues right. And unfortunately, the way the world works, if you want to get top talent, you got to pay for it. So I would never say, you know, just raise their salaries and do nothing else. We've got to do a lot of other things. The court needs to be changed substantially. But I think that in the long run, that's got to be part of the equation. Okay, let's get Skip on the line then. Skip, good morning. Uh, we have about two and a half minutes before we have to take a break. So what's what's on your mind? Go ahead, please. Okay, sir, thank you. And Rob, thanks for coming on. And right, right before election day, it's always perfect timing, first Monday of the month. Uh, and sir, um, first I want to tell you down here in Valley County, I think you'll appreciate this. Tomorrow we have an opportunity to get a John Baker uh, proclaim John Bircher out of office and replace him with a, uh, a consummate real Republican. That would be Wayne Ruff, uh, in a, for Senate. And so that's the first thing I wanted to tell you. Secondly, your, your new paper in the Frontier Institute, uh, your 2024 paper, uh, about Montana Supreme Court, uh, I think an institution in need of reform, uh, that's come up a couple of times in the past couple of weeks. One with a, a meet and greet with Corey Swanson. You know that guy for, uh, in, who's running for Chief Justice. And, and, uh, he, he, uh, referred to a few things that, uh, we all talked about in like an interactive lecture hall one night. 
And then this morning, I was discussing it with Jason Ellsworth, the president of the Senate, uh, he and I were talking about his run for um, for uh, clerk of the Supreme Court. So your your, your teachings and and the way you lay things out, uh, everybody's starting to to uh, know about them. So my question is simple, and it has a, it's a learning curve question. Would you please explain what uh, the the procedure is in the state of Montana, and if it's different than other states? as to how we select our electors who, in fact, finally elect our president. If you'd delve into that a little bit so people understand the process, I appreciate it. And thank you for coming on every month. Okay, thank well, you, sir. And we will do that right after the break. 721-1290 is our number. Talking about electors, we have Jeff, Dave, Casey, and Marilyn all waiting to visit with Rob Nadelson. And we're only half done with our, our hour with Rob, so we're coming right back after this. Hey, we are back on Talk Back. Rob Nadelson joining us. Okay, uh, Skip's question: Who chooses the electors uh, who will cho- for for Montana? Who will uh, submit uh, their 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 votes for president? Well, first, let me say what he had to say about the uh, Frontier Institute study. If you if you if you like the Frontier Institute uh, study uh, of the Supreme Court that I did. Uh, let the Frontier Institute know that. I mean, that's very important feedback. It's nice that I know it, but it's also nice to know the sponsoring organization know, uh, knows about it. If you didn't like the study, well, don't say don't say anything. <laughs> As to the issue of how electors are chosen in Montana, you know, um, I had to run to the computer for some of the nuts and bolts, but basically each political party will designate two people, a, a, a candidate for elector, for presidential elector, and an alternative uh, in case that, uh, uh, in case the first person is unwilling to perform the duties. And then uh, each party offers its selection of electors. So in, uh, most recently in uh, uh, Thelma Baker was an elector. Uh, Thelma Baker from Missoula, who owns the owns the Thunderbird Motel. Um, if the if a plurality of Montanans vote for a particular slate of electors, doesn't have to be a majority. But if a plurality votes for a given slate of electors, then that slate is elected. So in the last election, the three Republican elector elector candidates were selected. And they went on, met in Helena, the state capital, as is designated by the U.S. Constitution, and cast their votes for the Republican nominee. So, in in a nutshell, that's it. Um, All right. That's enough, I think. All right, let's get Jeff on uh, the line. Jeff, good morning. Thanks for holding her on with Rob Nadelson. Go ahead, please. Solway, Rob. Solway. Um, First, we know me. And then a question. On your, uh, I, I asked, on your, I quit. No, I asked you. That means what's new? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that part. There's a okay. delay. I, that, that disappeared. Sorry. Um, That's a that delay. Yeah, the delay is there. To make, your, the delay is there to make Marshall? sure that uh, and the delay is there to make sure that if I curse in Latin, they can they can block it out. All right. Go, go ahead, Jeff. I don't know that Peter would even know. Jeff, <laughs> what, 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 what's your blinkety blank question? Go ahead. <laughs> all righty. Uh, first of all, a comment and then a question on Don John Marshall. Uh, a comment is that on May 30th, I think our republic died. It died when a corrupt Soros bot, the New York City DA, convinced 12 citizens to convict former President Donald Trump on a bookkeeping issue that the DA somehow imaginatively manipulated into 34 felonies. And yes, we can still vote, and our vote matters at the state and local level, but I just see the monstrous bureaucracy taking over at the federal level. And without an Article 5 Convention of States, which the idiotic birchers uh, uh, try to uh, defeat, I just don't see us doing anything at the, at the federal level. Um, and, but uh, for John Marshall, I believe he was the one who came up with the with the uh, philosophy, now dogma, pretty much, that the Supreme Court has the final say on everything in the land. Before then, they issued opinions, but those opinions 
were not uh, held as absolutely final. Is there anything co- constitutionally that requires a, either of the other two branches of government to say, uh, okay, fine, we've got to go do something different, or can they? Is there something that, that would allow them to thumb their nose and say, we think you're wrong, do something about it? All right, thanks, Jeff. I'm really, I'm really glad you asked that question because it's treated in both my series on John Marshall and it's also mentioned in my paper on the Montana Supreme Court. The myth is that John Marshall invented judicial supremacy. That is, the myth is that John Marshall said that the Supreme Court is absolutely supreme uh, on constitutional matters that nobody else can issue constitutional opinions, that this is exclusively the province of of the Supreme Court. Um, The Supreme Court of Montana, or several justices thereof, in 2021, issued opinions in which they took Marshall's comments out of context for the same proposition. We the boss, okay? You know, nobody can question us in that respect. Actually, that is not what John Marshall said at all. What John Marshall said is that if a case comes before us and you have a contradiction between a statute and the Constitution, then in that case, we will apply the Constitution rather than the statute. And a common analogy is this. If the legislature has two laws, one is the earlier and one is later, and they contradict each other, then the court has to choose between them. If it finds a contradiction, it has to apply the later law. And so similarly, if there's a contradiction between the um, be, between what the um, what, what the statute says and what the Constitution says, then they have to apply the Constitution. That's all that Marshall meant by his famous comment that it is emphatically the uh, duty of the Supreme Court to say what the law is. That is in the case before. Now, the, the claim that no other part, branches of government can have their own constitutional opinions, Marshall never said that. And in fact, in 1800, when he was a member of Congress, he stood up before the Congress and said, there are certain areas of the law where the president's, the executive's view is supreme that should not be submitted to courts. So not only didn't he say that there was judicial supremacy or exclusive power in the Supreme Court to adjudicate constitutional cases. He had actually given a very well publicized speech saying exactly the opposite. So this this was one of the one of the things I called the Montana Supreme Court out on was this misuse of Marbury versus Madison and Madison's com and the Marshall's comments in it. Okay, with that, uh, we're, we're less than a minute away from a break. So I want to give Dave, Casey, and Marilyn plenty of time to state their questions without being interrupted. So we'll take that break right now. Seven, but we still have several phone lines open for Rob Nadelson. Only a few precious minutes left. So if you have a question, give us a call. 721-1290 is our number. We'll be back right after this. If you served, we want you to get the health care and benefits you earned. We want you to come to VA. There's never been a better time to apply. Under a new law called the PACT Act, we've expanded VA care and benefits to millions of people who served and their survivors. No matter where you served or how long you served, check out va.gov slash PACT to learn more about what VA can do for you and your family. Come Come to to VA. Hey, we are back. This is Talk Back. Rob Nadelson from the Independence Institute is on the phone with us right now to answer your questions about uh, all things to do with what's going on in the world, especially with the Constitution. Dave is up next. Hey, Dave, good morning. You're on Talk Back. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I agree with you on the Trump trial that Donald Trump won't spend any time in prison for, for the conviction. But, you know, I watched most of the trial really diligently, and, and I come, came to the conclusion that, that Donald Trump did have sex with Susan McDougall and Stormy Daniels, and that uh, David Pecker, uh, Donald Trump, and his l- lawyer and later his accountant all conspired to, to pay the girls off and keep it quiet and then play games with the, the money. 
keep it hidden. Yeah, I, 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 I have no idea. I mean, I'm not privy to Trump's sex life. Um, I think that the that the fact that it was paid to her to keep it quiet is admitted. Um, it's a, a hush money settlement, which is not all that uncommon. Um, but that's not what he was on trial for. He was on trial for allegedly reporting the expenditure in the wrong way. Right, hiding the money. That's what, ultimately, that was the federal crime, I guess. Well, well wait, 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 I, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say hiding the money because because it was reported. I mean, it was reported as an expense. Uh, right. the, the real well, question is whether the, the real question in my mind, and I, I did not follow this trial blow by blow. To be honest with you, I don't have the time. But the real question in my mind is. Um, was this really a campaign expense or was it simply an expense to protect him and his family from embarrassment or was it some combination the, the problem dave is that in a it, i mean we can speculate about that but the problem is that in criminal law you're always supposed to interpret statutes and events uh in favor of the defendant so if there's any reasonable doubt about whether it was really a campaign expense or not then you have to give the doubt to the defendant. And it doesn't really sound like that's that was done here. Well, the jury thought there was reasonable. Uh, they thought yeah, it was pretty much a sure thing. So that's why they went for conviction. Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, there would be two responses to that. Number one, Stormy Daniels' testimony never should have been admitted because it was inflammatory. And I think there's something to that argument. The other, of course, is the demographic of Manhattan. I mean, you could hardly pick a more hostile jurisdiction for Trump, uh, except maybe Washington, D.C. So, um, you know, you know, you know my problem gonna, was I'm, with the... I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to get into pluses and minuses of this. All I would say is that in a, in a different time, uh, this suit would not have been brought, and uh, the suit was, and for a different defendant, the suit would, would not be brought, as is evidence as is evidenced by the fact that this crime, the crime in this form has never been charged. Well, I would like to have seen Trump testify. And point two, why not bring bring his uh, his accountant back from prison to testify for Trump? But that would have been that would have helped solve some problems here. All right. Yeah, I, I don't know because it, yeah, I had no way of divining what the strategy of Trump's lawyers was. All right, Dave. obviously didn't work. Thank you for the call, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. We have Marilyn on the line next. Marilyn, good morning. You're on Talk Back with Rob Nadelson. Go ahead, please. Okay. So, um, hi, Rob. So, hi. there's some proof that the Convention of States has paid with Meckler, his name is on it, um, some brochures for Wayne Rusk and other rhinos who vote like Democrats down in the Bitterroot. So, um, weren't they and didn't Convention of States get in trouble before for some campaign um, things like that? And Wayne Rusk, um, he's got a criminal record that's been sealed. He changed his name to run for office. This is a problem, and I'm surprised the Convention of States would be on board with that. And so my question to you is if we get rhinos who vote like vote with Democrats, uh, going to convention of states, that's been part of some of, like, one of my issues is who will be involved in the convention of states and would they actually turn out some policies that we actually like if it's Democrats basically running the show? Um, so well, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Let me, it's actually kind of a double thing. Number one, I have no idea of the internal operations or decisions of convention of states. Uh, I used to provide uh, advice to them, uh, which ended at the end of 2021. I also provided advice to other uh, Article 5 groups. I never had any insight into the internal operations or how they selected, whom they were going to support. I also can't speak to the merits of that particular case. As to who attends a convention of states, that is up to the legislature at the time. Um, and I, I'm just being a conservative myself, 
I say to myself, when is there going to be a better time? You've got a super majority of legislatures controlled by Republicans. I realize that some of them are softer than others. You've got a Supreme Court, which is the best of my lifetime, not a conservative court, but a centrist court, one that is, is going to be fair. Um, I, I know that if the political winds change and we wind up with a majority of Democratic state legislatures and a liberal Supreme Court, they're probably not going to hold off. They're going to hold, have their convention. And so in, one of the rules in politics is you have to catch the wave, you know. There's a tide in the affairs of men, and right now, to quote Shakespeare, and right now this is a this is a good time. Uh, it may not be a good time five years from now or, or ten years from now. Okay, I guess my last comment, follow-up to that, would be that I wish people would get better informed about who the John Birch Society is, what political involvement they have in trying to get constitutionally um, informed people elected to office and and constitutional bills passed and you know they've been hard at it for many many years and they've got defamed by people who are communists calling the John Burr Society communists and they're not they're the ones that have been fighting the communists for many 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 years so that's it well Thank you. I mean oh. you want uh, since, right. since you brought it up, since I'm on the air, Thanks, uh, let, me give you my, let, me, let me give you my take on the Birch Society. It, it's basically a mixed, a mixed bag with them. I mean, they, they're, they're, uh, many of their views are, are, are pretty mainstream conservative. I mean, they're not weird views at all. Uh, there are other views that I would disagree with, but that are, you know, are held by responsible people. On the other hand, they do tend to get off on... Um, conspiracy theories that with very little ev evidence and in the area of convention of states i think this is my personal opinion only that there's that they're scaring people to raise money on the issue that that uh that all of their claims have been disproven again and again and that in fact they've had to retreat from several of the, their claims so i mean you can cooperate with the john birch society on areas where they're right uh, and uh, oppose them in areas where they're wrong, just like you would do with, say, the Republican Party or any other group. Um, you, you cooperate with them when they're right, and you oppose, oppose them when they're wrong. And with that, we're with perfect timing. We're up against our final break. By the way, the phone lines are now clear. So if you've been trying to get through uh, to Rob Nadelson and didn't have an opportunity, give us a call, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. We still have about eight minutes left with Rob Nadelson. So we'd love to have your comments or questions right after this. We are back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number. Peter Christian here, Nick Christensen over there, uh, taking your phone calls and producing Talkback this morning. On the phone right now with Rob Nadelson from the Independence Institute. And in a very unusual situation, we find ourselves without people wanting to uh, pick your brain. So uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Nadels. What would you like to talk about? Well, there's no one calling because I've answered every possible objection. <laughs> that must be it. That must be it, yeah. Yeah. Actually, Peter, you raised an interesting question off the air, which which uh, referenced an article that I wrote, why Ron DeSantis could never be Donald Trump's running mate. Yes, sir. Running mate. And you were curious about why that's the case. You know, technically he could be. Um, the problem is that what the Constitution says is that when the presidential electors vote for president and vice president, um, they can only vote for one or the other from their own state. Now, uh, Donald Trump currently lives in Florida. Ron DeSantis, obviously, is the governor of Florida. Right. If they were to form a ticket and they were to carry Florida, then the Florida Republican electors would have a choice. They'd have to vote for Trump or DeSantis. And in a close race, the decision not to vote for one or the other uh, would... Um, uh, could be decisive. So, for example, they might say, well, the presidency is the more important office, so we're going to vote for Trump, but we're going to vote for somebody else, for vice president, because we were constitutionally barred from voting for DeSantis. In a close race, that could result with Donald Trump having a Democratic vice president. So, um, and then, so that's the constitutional problem there. Now, someone at one talk show came back to me and said, well, why couldn't Trump move across the border into Georgia? <laughs> 
And he could. He could. Uh, but that creates what we would call in politics bad optics, meaning it looks really bad. It right. looks right. very it very, look, looks very um, opportunistic and is likely to cost at least at least some votes. Um, then there's, of course, the, the traditional selection for, for, for criteria for, uh, for um, vice president. That is, you try to choose a running mate from a state that is in play, a running mate that uh, is going to help you with that state. Um, and hopefully it's going to be a state that has more than three or four electoral votes. Uh, so, for example, the selection that the, the suggestion that Trump choose South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, you know, I like Kristi Noem, uh, but uh, but she carries with her only three electoral votes, right. which is which Trump's going to get anyway. So this becomes a, a strategic question. I mean, Trump's best course politically would be to choose someone from a state that could go either way, who is very popular in that state, uh, who uh, is, has, is going to bring a significant number of electoral votes with him, and, of course, has a record, a proven record, of being, um, uh, you know, not flip-flopping, of being, being, a, being strong. Tell you what, tell you what, look, we do have, uh, we have another caller. We can probably get one more call in. Ed, good morning. Yeah. You're on Talk Back with Rob Nadelson. Go ahead, please. Hi, Ed. Yeah, I'm trying to Thanks for relieving me from that speech. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be quick, though. Uh, uh, in thinking about uh, what to call what happened to uh, Trump in this uh, in this trial, you know, it brings to mind uh, maybe the Democrat Manhattan Project. Uh, e even though, you know, I, I don't want to besmirch the, uh, the great effort in the Second World War to end the war as soon as possible, but it certainly was a quote Mont uh, Manhattan uh, project uh, for Trump. <laughs> You mean it helped uh, redounded to his advantages against his enemies? Uh, well, yeah, eighty-five percent. Chances are, eighty-five percent of the uh, uh, jury uh, or so uh, didn't vote for him, <laughs> and yeah, right. that might have been, right. yeah, uh, something and, and like fact, that. And in fact, the uh, the judge gave a contribution to Biden. And, yeah. and also to a political action committee that supported Biden. I don't understand why the judge didn't recuse himself in those circumstances. Um, yeah, it I, I, I wasn't can't. very much, but uh, it, it, no, it wasn't who he voted for, too. <laughs> right, right. I mean, uh, but but giving the money is different from the vote, and the vote is part of it is just, you know, the appearance of impropriety or in, appearance of, of, lack of lack of impartiality. Uh, you know, I don't know how this thing's going to play out. All I know is that again and again, Trump's enemies have overplayed their cards, and it winds up uh, blowing up in their face, something like the atomic bomb. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know, but I think probably this whole procedure will benefit Trump. I'm a little bit more concerned, though, about something a caller raised earlier, and that is what this says about the de degeneration of our of our political system, the targeted targeted use of, of the legal system against political enemies. Uh, it really does look like the last days of the Roman Republic. Yeah, thanks a lot. Ed, Ed thanks for Thank the call. You. Tell you what, we have about a minute and a half left, so I'm going to uh, leave that to you. Uh, not enough time to take another call, but I certainly want to leave it up to you to talk about uh, your future projects. What what kind of things are you working on at the Independence Institute, and how can we uh, read what you're doing? Well, first, let me do the commercial advertisement, and that is <laughs> you can find all my writings at independenceinstitute.org. Independenceinstitute.org, that's Independence Institute is all one word. Uh, and, of course, also the Epic Times, although eventually they all wind up at the Independence Institute website. I have two books out there, one called The Law of Article 5 and one called uh, The Original Constitution. They're available at either barnesandnoble.com or uh, amazon.com. Um, I'm getting in an intern this, who is actually from Montana. Uh, I have an intern from Montana who will be working with me this summer. And the first project I've given to him is actually to investigate 
what happened in those states that remained independent right after the federal government got started. The federal government got started with only 11 states. North Carolina had not yet joined the Union, Vermont had not yet joined the Union, uh, and um, Rhode Island had not yet joined the Union. So for a brief time, those, those three states were actually independent countries. What does that tell us about right. what was expected of the Constitution at the founding? And Rob, we are completely out of time. Thank you, as always. We look forward to our next visit, sir. I look forward to it as well. I'll see you in July, if not before. Thank you, sir. All right. So, Mr. Nick, what's coming up on tomorrow's fabulous program? Uh, we'll do open phones from 8 to 30, and then it'll be global hotspots for an hour and a half. All right. Uh, Mirdad and Michael will be one uh, one on the phone, one in the studio. And, uh, of course, your, your phone call is most welcome. Have a great day, everybody. Uh, Ace will be talking to you at 6 tomorrow morning. Have a great day.